only the grace of God can take you from being a sinner and make you one of his own and bring you into his family. Mm. Would you turn to 1 Peter this morning? 1 Peter chapter 1. I've got a, a challenging word today. I, I'd really covet your prayers this morning because it's a, it's a difficult subject. And when you ask God to allow you to wrestle with him in the scriptures, he does it. And um, today's going to be a challenge as we, as we look in the word today. Um, how many of you would say, and this is not being boastful, but how many of you would say that you are a praying person, that you pray? That you spend time talking to God and hearing from God. Now, let me ask you this, okay, because I knew that you're praying people. How often do you pray, Father, help me to be more holy today? How often do we pray, Father, God, help me to be set apart. Help me to be different. Help me to be more like you. Have you ever prayed that over your life, and do you do it on a regular basis? And then I want to take it a step further. Do you ever pray that over your family, that we would be more holy that we as a family would be different, that we would be set apart, that we would be more and more like Jesus. Sometimes I think we forget that being holy, being different, being sanctified, being set apart is actually our calling. That's who we're called to be. And, and we have a holy calling um, as individual Christians, but also as a family. We've got a humble calling, a, a heavenly calling on our lives. And I wonder, do you ever consider... That you, that, that you have been made holy. If you know Christ, you yourself have been made holy. Have you ever thought about that? That you right now, if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you know about the grace of God and you've experienced the grace of God and his blood has covered your life, that you right now, you are holy. <laughs> and if you've been made holy through Christ... You're called to be holy, which means that you're called to be different. You're called to be like him in every way, in every walk, in every witness facet of your life. As a matter of fact, that's how we worship God, by living for him. That's worship. By honoring him, that's worship. You have no greater calling on your life than the one that, that says, I'm to be holy. That's your calling. That's my calling. That's your family's calling. So do you ever pray that over your life? Lord, help me to see the importance. Help me to live in a holy manner. Help me to be set apart, to be different. Lord, I want to be like you. No, not for the sake of saying that I, that I want to be God or I want, that I'm like God, but for the benefit and blessing of being able to say that I truly love the Lord and I love his grace on my life and I, and I worship him and I live for him and my life is about him. There's no greater calling than to be holy and not to just be holy as an individual, but to be holy as a church family and holy as a physical family I know that often we get our roles confused and we often get our priorities out of whack and we think that we're supposed to be all these different things to all these different people but in truth we are first and foremost called to be like Jesus we're called to be holy so now examining your life would you say that you truly are holy Look on your life, because nobody else can do that. You get to do that today. You, you look at yourself, and you think about yourself. Would you say, I am holy? And I want to share with you a, a rather thought-provoking story. There was, this, there was this little boy. His name was Brody. We're going to call him Brody. All right? And he went into a church service at a, at a church with his caretaker or his nanny. And this little boy, he had never been to church before in his life. Okay. He, he, had never, he had never seen a building like, like this. He had never been in a, in a, in a building with, with all of these people. He had never seen a building with so many people in one small space. And he'd never heard the music. And he had never been to a Bible class. He had never heard a sermon. So he had never heard the gospel. And so this is quite the experience for Brody. You know, you, you know how it is. When you go somewhere fascinating for the very first time, you're just taken away by it. So, so for us, that'd be like going to Disney World for the first time or the zoo for the first time or a, a ball game for the first time. He was ecstatic. I'm at church. Woo! And, and, and he took it all in. And he watches everything. 
this little boy, and he internalizes everything that goes on, and he watches how in the Bible class, you know, he's, he's with children and youth, and he was noticing that they didn't really pay attention to what was being said. Um, he noticed that, that, they didn't, that, that they were there for other reasons, but he did enjoy learning about the passage and, and that was being taught. And he noticed, you know, uh, he'd never read a Bible before. So he goes into the worship service, and he notices how people, they were there, but he noticed that this place that was supposed to be a family, they didn't really act like a family. So when he comes in, he notices all these people, but nobody's welcoming to him. You know, like he, he just notices um, they don't really care about me. So he just noticed there's some dysfunction in the family. And then he sat in somebody else's seat and he got funny looks for that. And uh, then, then, he, um, and then he, he was never really greeted, but he tried to greet them, you know, and say, hey, my name's Brody. <laughs> First time at church. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the, the music, um, he heard the songs he had never heard before, but he couldn't figure out why the choir looked so bored. That he said the words were beautiful and he thought the songs were supposed to be cheerful and they were supposed to be enthusiastic, but he's like, it's so gloomy. Why do they look so sad, Brody thinks. And then um, that didn't really, that didn't phase him uh, as much though because he's taking it all in and he thought this must be the way you're supposed to be when you go to worship. And then the, the people begin to pray, but he looked around him and nobody's really praying. They just have their, they have their heads bowed, but nobody's really into it. You know, they're kind of, you know, playing with each other and looking around and not really focused. And then, and then it happens. The pastor comes and he presents a message and Brody hears the preacher give the church the most terrible news he had ever heard. And, and it was about a sinless man, but somehow he was God. And he hears this story and, he, and he's nailed to a cross. And the way that the preacher described it, he's like, this is terrible. Who could do this to this, to this man? He's so, he's so innocent, and he, and he hears the story, and this man, he's hurt, and he's tortured, and he's killed. And the preacher is saying that this man is still in pain. His heart is still hurt because there's something that wasn't being done for him that should be done by the people in the church. And the preacher was calling them to be holy. That's what God desires of us. And, and he was saying that it hurts God's heart. And this guy who died on the cross, and he found out it was Jesus who died on the cross for his sins, all he's asking us to do is to believe and to live for him and to be like him. And little Brody's taking all this in and he thinks, I know, I know why this preacher's telling all these people about this because there's so many of us that, that we're able to do something about it. That must be why he's saying it. That, and, and so we can, we can do what this man called Jesus is calling us to do. He's asking us to be holy, calling us to be holy. I can do that because he died for me. And, and, and so the preacher gives an invitation for the people who would like to trust in Jesus and serve Jesus to come forward, and nobody moves. And Brody's new at church, and he's like, did you not hear the man? He said, if you want to follow Jesus, move. <laughs> if you want to be holy and like him, move. And, and, and nobody, nobody's moving, and he's on the edge of his seat waiting for somebody to say, I got it. And, and, but nobody does, and Brody's upset because people are just... They're getting up and they're walking away as if nothing's ever happened. And they're treating it like they, that, they, that they've heard this over and over and over again, but nothing's ever happened. And Brody left the church that day and he was trembling. And his Nana takes him by the hand and she says, Brody, don't take it to heart. Don't look so different, okay? <laughs> because people might notice that you're different. But don't take it to heart. To be holy means to be different, right? To be peculiar, to be set apart, to be sanctified, to be called, to be chosen. It means that there is life and sensitivity to God's spirit. There's moving in your life and in your spirit. It means that you do show emotion. It means that you are truly happy that the grace of God is on your life. It means you're truly happy that the Holy Spirit has taken residence in your heart and in your life. And you're, and you're truly moved to, to, well, by grace to, to lead others to Jesus and to look like Jesus and to talk like Jesus. And you're moved in your heart to do great things for the Lord. It means that you're listening and it means that you're learning and that you're living for Jesus with all of your life. And, and so, so it, is a, it is a call to be different. It means that you take Jesus seriously. <laughs> It means that you take him literally. It means that you take him responsibly. So should we not be holy? Should we not be different? Should we not be distinct? Should we not be the same? Think about this. 
the people of God coming together and meeting with God, should we not leave out of here radiating the glory of God because we've been in His presence? Or are we just going to be the same? Believers in Christ are called to live a unique, different, holy lifestyle. And families, if we want to portray Christ in our families, then we must be holy. The Apostle Peter, um, he gives us great insight on this calling in this letter. Um, he's writing to a, a, a big group of Christians who have dispersed. Um, they've been saved, but they, they're now moving out, um, out of persecution okay? because troubled times are near. And, and so they're, they're, starting to be, they're starting to be crutched, and they're starting to be pushed. And, and so the people are starting to move out and share the gospel all over, all over this area. And so Peter writes in the early 60s, uh, and, and he writes to encourage the persecuted. And he says, I, I want to exhort you, conduct yourself all the time in a way that brings honor to Jesus. Why? Because they were his special called chosen people. They were a royal priesthood and they're supposed to be an example to those who don't believe and they're supposed to, to, to be an example to those who oppose the gospel. And so it's in this first chapter that Peter, he addresses holy living. So all we're going to talk about today is one thing. We're going to talk about the problem with holy living. But I want you to see this whole text, 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 25, and then, um, then we're going to look at chapter 2, 1 through 3. Would you stand as we read today? Um, 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare yourself is what he's saying. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Prepare yourself. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's talking about them having hope, living with hope, okay? As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is what? Holy. You also be what? Holy. Holy. In all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And then skip down to chapter 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babies, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Father, just... Speak to our hearts today. Change us, God. I pray that we're not like the church that Brody went to, where we are in the presence of the Lord, the holy presence of God, and we're here trying, we need to be worshiping and hearing from Him and experiencing His glory. I pray that we would not leave here unmoved. And I pray, Lord, that you would do just, just a mighty, amazing work today, something that we have never seen before. We, we pray with an expectant heart, God. We want you to move in this place. We want your spirit to have free reign in this place. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bind the enemy right now and, and keep all hindrances and obstacles out of the way so that the people of God would hear from the very word of God and they would also respond to, to this holy God who loves us and gave himself for us. And I pray, Father, that if there's one here that doesn't know Jesus, Christ, that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that has not experienced the, the holy power, saving work of Jesus Christ, that they too would be made holy today through your blood, through your grace, through your, through your mercy. Speak to us today, Lord. Help us to, to, to make sense of this text. We're relying on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
holiness reminds us that there is a definite and destructive problem with us. Now, I'm going to explain that for a moment. We're simply not holy on our terms, right? We're not holy on our terms, but that's often the problem. We say that, that we read in the Bible that we're supposed to be holy as God is holy, yet we don't want to be holy like He is holy. So we want to, we want to, to be holy for ourselves, and it just doesn't work that way. How, how can we, who are hopeless and unholy on our own, ever know what holiness truly is without knowing the one who is holy? We can't. <laughs> This is a huge problem if we try to do this on our terms. If you try to be holy on your own, you're not going to be able to do it. So we must remember, God is the most holy one. He's the only holy one. God is holy, verse 15 tells us. So if we are ever going to be holy, then we have to follow his example. But how often do we wander, right? How often we're called and challenged to be different, but... We're like the church that Brody went to. We don't move. We don't desire it. We don't pursue it. Why? Because there's a definite and destructive problem with holiness. And it has to do with conformity. It has to do with conformity. Aren't we prone to conform to the pattern of this world? <laughs> Which is why we have a problem with holiness. <laughs> Paul, Peter wrote in verse 14 that we must leave behind the former lust. And all I could think about was Forrest Gump when Jenny said, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Is it that way when we're to follow Christ, we're to, we're to leave behind, we're to run from those things, those former lusts that, that we co possibly can conform to because we're not supposed to. We can't give in to them. We can't afford to. And the problem is the world has seen enough. As a matter of fact, I believe that God and his church has seen enough of so-called believers in Christ who daily conform to the world and staying, instead of being transformed into the image of Christ. We're called to be obedient children instead of disobedient children. I've always likened this battle to this huge game of spiritual tug-of-war you, you, where the enemy's pulling you one way to conform to the pattern, to the former lust, to the former lies and lures, but then Christ, he's on the other side and he's trying to draw you to himself. He's trying to draw you into to being obedient and, and good followers of him and he's trying to, to make you like him, but Satan, he wants you to go back and he wants you to conform back and he wants you to go back to the former lust, but Christ, he wants you to come forward. So Satan wants you to be disobedient, imitators of the world, but Christ on the other side wants you to be obedient and imitators of him. You don't don't have to be what you used to be is what Peter's saying. We're not supposed to be what, we're what we used to be. We're supposed to be holy like him who is holy. We've got a new father now. And you've got to understand that. I've got to understand we've got a new father now, a new family. We've got new freedom. Live free is what Peter's saying. Live free. Live changed. Live redeemed. Live saved. Conformity says go back. Conformity says blend in. Conformity says look like the world. Live like the world. Love the world. But conversion and transformation in Jesus says you've got to be different. <laughs> You gotta be, you gotta be holy. Be forewarned though. As we strive to be holy, you're gonna be tempted to conform. You're gonna be tempted to go back. Look at what Peter says. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. You did that in ignorance, he says. He gives you a what do they call it? A mulligan? You did that in ignorance. You didn't know, but he who has called you is holy. Therefore, be holy in your conduct. Because, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. We seem to have this embedded in our culture. Everywhere you look, you see people and program and politics and power urging the masses to condone one another's sins, urging people to accept one another just the way that they choose to live. And the truth is that if you don't agree and believe as they do, if you don't go against the grain, if you try to make a stand, if you try to preach the truth, you're told that you're a bigot. <laughs> You're told that you're intolerable. You're, you're told that you're indifferent and wrong. So what does the majority do? Nothing. They do nothing. They stand back. They allow sin to win. They don't fight in the truth in love. They do nothing. They essentially conform. And we wonder why the church is so unholy today. We do nothing. 
You're constantly going to be squeezed, folks, to conform. You're constantly going to be fed this lie by the enemy that your life before Jesus was much better than the one you've got now. <laughs> Don't believe that junk. Be transformed. Be holy. There's a problem with holiness, though. There's a problem with it because we try to redefine it. It's not conformity. There's another issue with it, though. It's called casual Christianity. Have you ever been aggravated by holiness before? Aggravated by it? I'll tell you a story. Um, I went to a preaching conference with some brothers of mine uh, a little while ago. And I came into that meeting with a terrible attitude. And I knew the environment, like, I knew that the environment would be warped by religion. And of course, my jadedness in my past, you know, in my past and the religious repetition and legalism from other experiences I've been a part of, my mindset was already made up. I'm going to have a miserable time here. So what did I do? I came in. I'm not ready to worship, even though there are people all around me. They're worshiping. Well, before the preacher came, the host of the event, he said something like this. He said, tonight's preacher is so-and-so. It doesn't matter who it was. And he said, I've asked him to preach tonight because I know he'll have a word from God. But then he said this. I don't know of anybody better to preach the word tonight than this man because he exemplifies holiness in his life, in his family, in his church, in his ministry. And this man of God steps forward, and I'm sitting there, you know, like this. I don't like what I see because I just knew this place was not, not for me. And this man of God comes up, and he brings this incredible message on the living word, the powerful word of God, and he preaches it hard, and he preaches with passion, he preaches with power, and yes, there are times where I'm like, that's just your opinion, and, 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 it, and it was, and then sometimes I disagreed with him, but he gave this great message, but do you know what the problem was? The problem was me. His convictions and mine didn't always line up, so what did I do? I judged the man, and I tuned him off, and I turned him out several times because I didn't care to live how disciplined, hear how disciplined he was. I didn't care to, to hear how strict he was. I didn't care to hear that he throws his TV out the window because he don't want that junk in his house. And I'm like, I have a TV. <laughs> and, then, and then he says, then he says, I dismissed a couple in my church. The preacher's saying, I dismissed a couple in my church because they refused to get right with God. I got mad at that. I'm like, who gives you the power to do that? And he's like, well, the Word does. <laughs> and I'm like, this the whole time. <laughs> And then, and then he says, he said, I asked a deacon to step down because his lifestyle was contrary to the word. I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> and I started getting aggravated. I started getting aggravated by this high and holy attitude that I thought this man was, was giving us. And I left that night. I didn't receive a blessing, but I was bothered because this man was so strict. He was so disciplined, and I was aggravated by holiness. And you know what God did to me over that? He began burning my heart and troubling my spirit and keeping me up at night <laughs> and pricking my heart because, you know, you know what he pressed on me? He said, Peter, God's spirit burdened me and troubled me. It seemed like he was saying to me, you're so aggravated with his holiness, not because you disagree with him about his lifestyle. You're aggravated with him because you're too comfortable in your own casual Christianity. And Peter, you need to grow up. Oh, my. And God burned my heart, and he lovingly yet firmly reminded me that just because this man was firm and rigid and, and in his walk didn't mean that he was wrong. And it, it just meant that he wanted to be holy. <laughs> okay? And, and even if it meant for him to throw some things out of his life, God re began to remind me, Peter, you don't need some of the junk in your life either. <laughs> you could be a little holier, buddy. <laughs> And he began to show me all the wasted worldly investments that I had, all the wasted time, all the wasted opportunities, all the wasted divine appointments that I forfeited because I was too casual in my walk with God, too casual in my witness, too casual in my worship. And God began to remind me with great chastisement, Peter, what was your motive when you came to worship that night? You weren't worried that my presence was there. <laughs> You weren't worried that the Holy Spirit of God did touch down in that place and saved a soul that night. You weren't, you weren't focused on worship. You were worried about being better than this man. So the problem wasn't him. God says the problem is you. Don't be so casual in your commitment is what the Lord was laying on my heart. Don't be so casual in your calling and your approach to my holiness. He says, I'm a, I'm a big God. I'm holy and I'm worthy of your best. So you better live your best. 
I'm worthy of your love. I'm worthy of your devotion, your life, your all. So this is the point, folks. So the next time we get together to worship, whether it be in a big church or a little church or a house church or a youth church, whether it's in a tent or a barn or a school or a classroom or a chapel building, you come to worship. Amen. Why? Because there's a holy God in the building. <laughs> So you come, and don't you be casual about it either. Don't you be complacent. You're not coming to see a man. You're coming to see God. Amen. God convicted me and whipped me and fussed at me <laughs> because he was reminding me that a holy lifestyle has to be lived in view of a holy God. Peter said, remember, your conduct is to be holy because God is holy, not because the preacher is holy or because the church is holy, but because God is holy. So if you must be holy, be holy because God is, and he calls you to be. No room for being casual. There's no room for a lack of commitment. There's no room for you to look at how everybody else is living. That's shallow. You worry about your own commitment to Christ and let God deal with others in his way. Okay, I'm telling you, that man that I was so aggravated with that night, he was so disciplined, I think, and rigid and firm and almost seemingly dogmatic about his lifestyle because he knew that if he didn't give God everything, if he were casual in the least of things, that he would conform in the greatest of ways. Understand, church, we can't afford to be casual in our walk. That's a major issue in the church today. Okay, we're too casual that, that we pervert the holy Everything we do matters. Everything that we're about as a church, that matters. Should church be fun? Absolutely. You should love your church. You should love coming to worship. You should love the people of the fellowship. But fun isn't the goal. Holiness is the goal. Amen. Okay? And should church be relevant? Absolutely. Jesus is an all-time Jesus. He's been here forever. He's going to be here forever. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. So that means that everything that you do and I do as a church, it should be relevant. Everything should have a purpose. But relevance isn't the goal. Holiness is the goal. Should I feel welcomed in this church? Should I feel loved in this church? Should I feel like anybody and everybody could come into this place regardless of where they come from or where they've been and what they've been through? Ugly and everything? Absolutely. We ought to burn the place down if we ever stop reaching lost people. Okay? But again, this place of worship, not made for me, made for him. Holiness as a fellowship is the goal. And my prayer is that everybody and anybody will come here and hear the gospel, but also that everybody and anybody will come to know Jesus and experience that life-changing transformation and growth in Christ and start showing Christ and start truly looking like Christ and loving Christ and living for Christ. The holiness of God is what changes people. We don't have time to be casual, nor do we have time to be aggravated by others' holiness or lack of holiness. We should be concerned with honor and worshiping the holy of holies ourselves. My last thing, last problem. There's a definite and destructive problem with the comprehension of holiness. People simply don't understand what holiness really is. Nor do they understand that you can be holy in an unholy world. Many equate holiness with perfection in the sense that you've got to live in a faraway holy house and you've got to wear holy garments and you've got to separate yourselves from any fun that you shouldn't have stuff or that you shouldn't have any money or a good job or a career. Some people think that being holy means that you become a hermit and you live in a holy house and a holy huddle and have a holy lifestyle and that you should just be silent and in solitude and that there should be no silliness about you. So they act like this all the time. I'm being holy today. <laughs> That's not for me. Real holiness is that genuine, authentic character and lifestyle of a man and a woman of Christ who has been redeemed, restored, transformed, and empowered and filled by the Spirit of God to live in such a way that it reflects the unflawed and holy character of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're asking, how can I be perfect Am I supposed to be perfect? How can I be sinless? That's not going to happen. Okay? We're going to sin at some point, but nothing less than holiness is the goal. Make being like Christ your goal. You've got, you've got to have a proper understanding of what holiness is and what it means for you and I who are unholy to be like him. Holiness is simply following in the footsteps, the pattern of being like Jesus. 
That means that you're distinct. That means you're separate. That means that you're unique. That, that's why Peter says, as obedient children, don't conform yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. But as he called you who is holy, you also be holy in your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Be like me. Imitate me is what Paul would later say. Holiness means that I actively put on Christ. That means I actively put on his character, his spirit. It's authentic. It's real. No phonies allowed. And I'll explain to you more about that pattern tonight. You know, I like authentic things. There are certain things in my life that have to be authentic. Like the money I make. It needs to be real. <laughs> okay? <laughs> When I purchase things like for the yard or work supplies, I don't, I don't like the Saturday special. I want the real stuff, the manly stuff, okay? I prefer them to be nice tools, even if, they don't, if I don't know what I'm getting. <laughs> the ink pens that I use, I like an authentic ink pen, like the Pilot G207 gel pen. The computer I use needs to be an authentic computer. I expect an authentic, never frozen or quick fixed meal when I go to a sit down restaurant. I want it to be authentic. And it's the same with the holiness of Christ. You've got to make up your mind, in your heart, in your soul, with your life, if you're going to pursue a real, authentic, and true holiness or some counterfeit. I want the real holiness of God. Authentic. Peter's letter in verses 14 and 15 tells us to be holy as God is holy. That means that you can't have a destructive concept of God and His holiness. If you cheapen Him, you cheapen life itself. If you cheapen His holiness, you cheapen holiness itself. If you cheapen holiness, you cheapen your calling, your witness. You end up cheapening the gospel. He's the authentic holy one. And that means nobody compares to Him. That means that nobody, nobody in any way, he's in, all, he's in a class by himself. He's subject to nothing. He answers to no one. This is who our holy God is. He's above us, beyond us, and he's so different and so rare in the scriptures that if anyone, and it didn't matter if you were devout or educated or esteemed, if anybody came into his presence, they would literally crumble to the ground. That's the holy God that we serve, and that's the holiness that God wants to have on your life. So that when you, walk, when you walk for the Lord, people are humbled by your presence because they see the holiness of God in your life. When was the last time somebody said, Whew, you're too holy? <laughs> when was the last time that your face shone like the radiant Son of God? <laughs> that people knew you were different the moment you walked in the room and said, wow. Look at what the Lord is doing in their life. Moses was told that nobody could see God and live. Isaiah condemned himself when he was in the presence of the Lord. John fell as a dead man in the presence of Jesus. The prophet Habakkuk, he trembled. His lips quivered at the sound and presence of the Lord before him. And the Bible says that rottenness entered his bones when he was in his presence. He was overwhelmed. To be holy means that I understand that I've got to be pure. Holiness is being set apart from anything impure in order to be completely given over to God. Holiness is perfection. Holiness is flawless. Holiness is without sin. And that's what he's called us to do. And once again, we look at this and we say, and then we look at the scriptures and it says, be holy for I'm holy. And you're like, how in the world am I supposed to be holy? It looks so impossible. How can my family be holy? Because this, this lifestyle, I'm not, I'm not accustomed to that. How can I do that? Because I know what the Bible says about me. It says that I'm a sinner, that I've transgressed over and over and over again. And you name it in the Word of God, and I've probably done it in some manner. But in our minds, we're rotten. And the only way to escape is to actually be holy. And you know that you can't be holy on your own terms. That's why there's a problem with holiness. Because to be holy means that I can't see God unless I too am holy. Which means I've got to comprehend that the probability of holiness in my life apart from Jesus is none. You won't be holy if Jesus isn't in your life. This creates a dilemma. Because you know as well as I do that I'm not holy in any way on my own two feet. What about you? When I read Jesus' words to be perfect, therefore as your Father in heaven is perfect, I tremble because I can't own up to that on my own. 
When I read that I'm to be holy as God is holy, I say that there's no way by human means to be that. When I read in Psalm 24 that the only ones who can ascend the mountain of the Lord, in other words, the only ones who can enter into the presence of God are those who have clean hands, a pure heart, and whose mind is on the truth and whose lips are pure, I feel pretty worthless and hopeless because my life is not holy. My hands are not clean. My heart is not pure. There are times when I look nothing like Jesus. Anybody relate? There are times where I don't, I just don't own up. I don't add up in my thoughts and my priorities. I can never climb to that holy hill where God is. Comprehend that. That in all truth, man is nothing but a contradiction to the holy character of God. And in truth, we're caught red-handed. In truth, we are worthy of hell. We are worthy of eternal separation from God, damnation from God. We're all worthy of that. The unrighteous, the unholy will not inherit the kingdom. The Bible's clear about that. Those who do not live for Jesus will not be with him. 1 Corinthians 6 says that. John 8 says that if I've committed sin, I'm a slave to sin. Romans tells me that I've fallen short of God's glory and the wages is death. So what do we do? Do we continue to misinterpret what it means to be holy by trying to be perfect on our own terms? Do we continue to try to define it on on our own standards if we truly know what we need? Or do we look to the Holy One to see if there's mercy in Him? Do we look to the Holy One to see if there's love in Him, if there's grace in Him, if there's redemption and forgiveness and salvation in Him? You take a look. Look at 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. That'll answer your question. How can I be made holy? It's through the Holy Son of God. Look at 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout this time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You did not redeem yourself, which means you were not holy yourself. Okay, there's no silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ... As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Comprehend this. The only way that I can be pure, the only way that my family can be pure or holy, I can be holy, is if I'm covered by the Holy One's holiness himself. Thank God for Jesus. What God's holiness demanded, His grace provided in Christ. Christ went to Calvary. He gave Himself up as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world, presented Himself to God as a pure and holy and perfect sacrifice on the cross. And do you know what? God accepted it. It pleased Him. God accepted it. It was perfect. It was holy. It was what was required so that you and I could have salvation, so that you and I could understand that my sin was put on Christ, and thus he put his holiness on me. we got to understand, to comprehend this all-important truth today. I can stand before God right now as a holy child of his. Why? Because of Jesus. I'm covered in his holiness right now. Forgiven, accepted, loved, saved, adopted, granted eternal abundant life, not because of my comprehension of holiness, but because of his comprehension of holiness. Certainly there are some problems with holiness today because of our sin, because of our flaws, because of our brokenness and rebellion, but we don't have to stay in that problem state. You have a solution. You have the solution in Jesus Christ. He makes you worthy. He makes you holy. And He can do it within your life. And He can do it within your family's life. No more excuses, folks. No more saying, I can't do this. No more saying that, 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 I can, that I'm supposed to be broken and unholy. No more saying that because the holiness of God can make you holy. And I want you to, I want to ask you this, and and this is the closing point. Is there a problem in your holiness? You got to answer that today. Is there a problem in your holiness? Do you struggle to conform? You know the answer to that. Do you seek to be like everything and everyone else in this world, but like Jesus? Because if you do, you've got to struggle with conformity. 
Do you struggle with being a casual Christian? You don't truly take God seriously. You don't worship as you should. You don't witness as you should. You don't walk as you should. Do you struggle with with being a casual Christian? Are you casual about his holiness? Because he's not casual about yours. And do you struggle with comprehending holiness in the right manner? Because holiness isn't what we think it is. Holiness isn't about what we have done. It's all about who Jesus is and what he has done. Holiness seeks to be like him. Can you say today, as we go into invitation, can you say today that you and your family are living a holy life together? Can you say that? Why don't we seek to be like him together today? Why don't we take some time today and get with God and seek his holiness and ask for his holiness to pour over our lives and our families? You know what to do. Steve, would you just come and close us out in invitation today? If God's dealing with your heart about anything, if it has to do with your personal holiness, if it has to do with your family holiness, if it has to do with this church's holiness, if it has to do with the very fact that the holiness of God is not on your life because you don't know Jesus, you make sure that you don't leave this place unchanged. Because you don't have to be, you don't have to say that there's a problem with holiness anymore because there's not if you know Christ. There's no problem anymore. The problem has been solved through him. Let his holiness flood your life. You come if you need to. You come. Here I